بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد الله صل على محمد وآله وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم نجعل الأرض مهادا والجبال أوتادا وخلقناكم أزواجا وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ سُبَاتًا وَجَعَلْنَا اللَّيْلَ لِبَاسًا وَجَعَلْنَا النَّهَارَ مَعَاشًا وَبَنَيْنَا فَوْقَكُمْ سَبْعًا شِدَادًا وَجَعَلْنَا سِرَاجًا وَهَّاجًا وأنزلنا من المعصرات ماء ثجاجا لنخرج به حبا ونباتا وجنات ألفافا صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وآل محمد Continuing our discussion about some of the verses of Surah An Naba, we discussed the beginning part of Surah An Naba, and then last night we began the discussion about the second portion of it, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes some of the blessings that He has bestowed upon the human beings, and among those blessings are signs where. When someone really reflects upon them, he or she will conclude that there has to be a creator, a maker to this universe. And this creator, when we look at the signs of his creation, it points us that he created this creation when he put all these rules and all this perfection, probably for a reason. Again, another evidence about the existence of a creator and his magnificence, which then drives the human being once he or she realizes, recognizes that this universe has a creator. He created this creation for a purpose. Then one strives to discover this purpose and implement it in his or her life. And as Muslims, our biggest purpose really is attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As per the verse in the Quran in Surah At-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرِضْوَانٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ أَكْبَرُ And attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even greater than the blessings that the human will achieve in the Akhirah in terms of Jannah and the paradise, and the rivers, and the palaces, and so on and so forth. It's really the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's really our purpose in this world, in our career, attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we started by the discussion from verses number six and seven yesterday, where we talked about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this earth inhabitable for the human being. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke of the mountains. Now we move on to the next few verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks a little bit about signs, but in the human being. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa khalaqanakum azwaja. We created you in pairs. So again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He is the creator. So this is something interesting. There is a lot of discussion as the origin of species. Where did they originate from? How did they originate? In the middle 1800s, give or take, Charles Darwin introduced the origin of species where he suggested a theory called the theory of evolution, where the human being may have evolved from other species. This theory is the theory taught today in school. So if you go to university, high school, the only theory that is taught is the theory of evolution. That's how it's taught. It's taught as if it's a law. You know, there's something interesting. They say in philosophy, you can never prove a theory. You can only disprove a theory. But the way evolution is being taught, it is taught as if it is a law. The idea, obviously behind it, is that the human being may have evolved, gone through some phases of evolution until he or she has come to this state. Now, very briefly, obviously the people who talk about evolution, now evolution is an entire course taught at the university, so it's, we would not be doing justice to it in 20, 30 minutes talking about it here. Uh, but very briefly, there is obviously those scientists who speak of it, they, they bring evidence. One of the evidence that they present is that some experiment that was done by a couple of chemists where they put some inorganic chemicals, uh, those of you who know chemistry, inorganic things that don't deal with carbon, except carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, those two are exceptions. They're carbon containing species, but they're not organic chemistry. Okay. Everything else is organic chemistry that deals with carbon chemistry. Okay. So these scientists, they mix some ingredients without getting into all the nitty gritty details. And then they pass these species or these molecules through some very high voltage. A chemical reaction resulted, which then transformed these chemical species into an organic compound. So adding hydrogen, adding carbon dioxide, which is in the atmosphere, okay. adding some nitrogen, etc., etc., and then adding a very high voltage to it, it was transformed into an organic species. So they say this may be how life began on Earth. These chemicals exist in nature, and the high voltage could have come from lightning. Maybe you've had some really strong lightning that would have resulted in this kind of reaction. And this is maybe how life began on Earth. Another evidence that some of these scientists use is viruses. Those of you who study viruses, I, I think a lot of people have heard about viruses, especially now after COVID. Many people are familiar with them. So viruses mutate, they change. Okay. They say here is another example of Evolution, viruses mutate, they change. So there you go, that's another form of evolution that is happening. Although it's at the molecular level, it's at the micro level, but nonetheless it is happening. Along with other examples and evidences that they use. So again, I'm not here to discuss the whole theory of evolution and teach about the theory of evolution, that's an entire course at the university. But what I'm trying to say is that people who propagate this, they present evidence. It's not just something that they say, well, it just happened and this is how it is. Now, one thing important to note, not all scientists accept the theory of evolution. And I'm not talking about just those who are religious. No. Even some scientists who study evolution from a scientific perspective, 
they find it difficult to accept the theory of evolution as proposed by Darwin. For example, one of them is a professor at Lehigh University by the name of Michael Behe, B-E-H-E. Michael Behe is a biochemist and he studies bacteria. Bacteria is a single celled organism, one cell. We have lots of cells. You know. So bacterium as one cell. The bacterium that he studies inside the cell of the bacterium, there are a lot of what they call organelles, machines, machines that do different kind of work. Michael Behe came to the conclusion where he said, after studying the machines inside the bacteria, he said, though all these machines, they interdepend on one another. They really are tied up to one another. He says, it's difficult to imagine that one organelle kind of evolved and then just stayed hanging in there for some time until another organelle evolved and then until like that whole machine was put together. He says it's difficult to accept this. Now again, he's speaking as a scientist. So he wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box and he proposed the following. He said that I am not accepting the theory of evolution However, I propose the intelligent design theory. These machines, like the bacteria and the organelles and all that stuff inside it, is made by some intelligent designer. Now, interestingly, he does not want to call him God or Allah. No, no an intelligent designer. A designer, so there has to be a designer. Now, he wants to call him an intelligent designer. He wants to call him whatever he wants. That's up to him. One of his kind of people who were influenced by his discussions is another professor called Jonathan Wells. Jonathan Wells. He wrote another book called The Icons of Evolution, Science or Myth. Jonathan Wells then discusses the theory of evolution, again, as a scientist. He says, if we are to take the theory of evolution, it suggests the following. There was a time in history Let's call it time zero. I'm calling it time zero. Time zero is when you did not have any living, nothing living, zero, right? But then something happened that sparked life. Lightning, whatever it is, some life started appearing, all right? So we call that time zero. Now, this means at time zero, you only had this one particular life form. Let's call it A. After some times, A evolves. Now you have A and B, for example. After some time, another revolution happens where now C is introduced. So there is a chronological introduction to organisms. Meaning that if you go back in history and you study it in a chronological point, like I said, time zero, you have species A, after some millions of years or th hundreds of thousands of years, A and B, and so on and so forth, until you basically have the human being. He says, however, when we study organisms, we don't observe that. We don't see that organisms appeared in a chronological manner. There seems to be a time when they just coexisted. So this suggests that evolution may not be happening. So that's one issue that he had. This is now Jonathan Wells. The second, he says, a second issue that he discusses about is the theory of probability. If you have one coin, now if you have a coin, do you, have, do you guys have coins in New Zealand? Yes. Yeah, you do? Okay, all right. So coins, if you have a coin and you flip it, what are the chances of getting heads or tails? 50, right? Okay, what if you have two coins and you flip them? What are the chances that both of those coins will be heads or both will be tails? Is it still 50-50? Not anymore. The percentage dropped by 50% to 25%. So now it's 25%. What if you have four of them? The percentage is going down. 
What if you have a hundred of them? What if you have a million of them? What is the chances of a million coins? All of them, when they flipped, they all land on heads or all land on tails. From the theory of probability, they say it is almost impossible. It's almost impossible because the chances are so minute that they all land on heads or all land on tails. Okay. So he says from the perspective of probability, what is the likelihood that you had an evolution, which is a random process? What is the probability of this random process producing a human being? with all the enzymes and all the hormones and all the chemistry that goes inside the human being, what are the chances? For example, one simple thing, well, it's not really simple, it's quite complicated, but the whole thing of the pancreas and insulin. You know, subhanAllah, the pancreas has, if you may use the term very loosely here, and I know there are physicians here, they might get upset, but it's a sensor. It senses how much sugar you have in your blood. Sugar cannot get inside the cell without the help of insulin. Okay. The pancreas senses how much sugar do you have in your blood. It releases enough insulin so that basically it can facilitate the entry of glucose into the cells. All right. How does the pancreas know how much insulin to release? And if there's any slight problem in this whole process, then God forbid, a person may develop diabetes. So all this, not only this, the heart, the human heart uses energy to pump. 30% of the energy comes from glucose, 70% from fatty acids. If a person is diabetic and the glucose cannot enter into the cells, then what does the heart do? It's not gonna stop pumping. It shifts now mostly towards fatty acids. Fatty acids cannot enter the heart on their own. They're too big. The heart has to release an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase. This LPL has to facilitate the entry of fat into the heart. The minute sugar content drops, like when you're fasting. So when you're fasting, the rate of LPL goes very high because you're fasting. You don't have much sugar in your system. The heart has a sensor. So the pancreas has a sensor for how much sugar you have. The heart has a sensor, how much sugar you have. And all these sensors just work together, collaboratively to make sure that this whole system functions and operates all by coincidence. That's when I told you, if you remember a couple of nights ago, when I had a meeting with this professor of philosophy who was not a believer, I told him, listen, I'm gonna talk to you about, like as a scientist, not as a man of religion. I told him I worked on diabetes and, and heart disease for several years. I did research on this. And we used to attend conferences and present our research. So I told him, imagine if at one of these conferences, we say the following. Someone gets up and says, listen guys, thousands of researchers and doctors and people who are trying to study this whole issue of the heart disease during the state of diabetes. Someone gets up and says, listen guys, you are wasting time and money. You know, billions of dollars are invested annually, globally, on this issue about heart failure in diabetic patients. Why does the heart fail in diabetic patients? Billions of dollars globally is being spent on this research. They're trying to find out why. Why does it happen? How does it happen? So I told him, imagine if at one of these conferences, a person gets up and says, you guys are wasting money, time, efforts, all, I know why. The reason why 80% of diabetic patients die from heart failure is because of a random process of evolution. I told him honestly, what do you think will be the reaction of the scientific community to this individual? 
He didn't say anything. I told him at the very least, if they want to be polite, they would say, sorry, that does not make any sense. Are you trying to tell us that 80% of diabetic patients have a cardiomyopathy and their heart fails because of a random process of evolution and we're wasting our time and money and energy? What nonsense is this? I told him if scientists cannot accept that a heart can fail through a random process, how do you want me as a scientist to accept that this whole universe, with all its chemistry, with all its laws of physics, exists through a random process? His response was, well, maybe we don't understand the source. Well, wait a minute. Our discussion is not about understanding the source. Rather, it's about what? The existence of a source. And you just confessed there is a source. Now, you want to call him a source, intelligent designer, whatever you want to call him, you call him. We call him Allah. So it's a very interesting concept. And that's why Jonathan Wells uses that theory of probability. The theory of probability. And he says that it just does not make sense as well. When you use probability, what is the chances that all these evolutionary steps happened randomly to produce this human being? For example, why did the heart end up being up here? And the kidneys just randomly wherever they're supposed to be. And the brain ended up where it's supposed to be. You know, what, I mean, what, how could all this random, randomly just happen? Okay. So that's the second issue that Jonathan Wells had. The first one, as I mentioned, was the chronolo chronological appearance of organisms throughout history, which he says it does not happen. Second is probability. The third, he references Michael Behe, which a theory that Michael Behe uh, produced called irreducible complexity. Meaning, like I said, Michael Behe talks about a bacteria. You know, he studies bacteria. And he says the bacteria, when I look at the cell of a bacteria, whatever organelles that are found in the bacteria, you, know, you cannot reduce this any further. I mean, the bacteria has all the machinery to help it operate and function. Otherwise, it would not work. I mean, just to give an analogy, and this analogy is from me. You know, this is my analogy. If you want to go and buy a car, okay, shred all the bells and the whistles on the car, you know, all the AC and the automatic windows and all. If you go to someone and tell him, build me a very simple car, something that's a car. I don't care, I don't even want anything. Doors, they're unnecessary. You don't need doors in a car, for example. In fact, there are some cars that don't have doors. So doors I don't want, windows I don't care about, build me a car. What would be the simplest form? You'll have to have an engine. And you will need wheels, otherwise the car is not gonna move. So some engine, some wheels, and maybe some controls. You need maybe a steering wheel somewhere to control this car. Without those, you can't have a car. Like, you know, the guy will tell you, okay, here is an engine, there you go, this is your car. He says, no, that's not a car, that's an engine. I want a car. So the, the simplest car has to have some simplest, you know, machinery components to make it a car. You cannot reduce it any further than this. Like we said, for example, the engine, the wheels, the fuel, etc., etc. So he says, basically, a bacterium cell is the least of the components that you have to operate a functional cell. And separately, these are useless. It's like someone giving you an engine, says, it's useless, what do I care about the engine? Without the whole machines and the tools. Or someone gives you the wheels, here we go, take the tires and that's it. Useless, I don't care about the tires by themselves. So, he says this theory of irreducible complexity is what suggests that you need the whole components together to operate and function well. And therefore he says that evolution would not make any sense on these fronts. Now remember, these are scientists. They're talking from a scientific perspective. They're not talking from a religious perspective. So 
Then comes the question, then how do we explain like what viruses? So we know that viruses mutate. Our response, our response is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he creates every being, he creates some survival mechanism. In us, the human being is the immune system, for example. That's some defense mechanism. That's a defense mechanism. In the virus, maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made these mutations as forms for this virus to survive. Allahu a'la. That could be one possibility. Why do we have that? It does not necessarily mean just because the virus is mutated that there is a, a evolution and the human being came from a random process and so on and so forth and from other species. Okay, so that's one. Second thing, people then argue, they say, okay, what about the DNA? Something interesting about the DNA, those of you who study DNA or know about DNA, it has only four letters. Well, they call them the codons. The A and the T and the C and the G. These four, the order you put them in, subhanAllah, makes a tree a tree, a strawberry a strawberry, a mouse a mouse, and a human a human. But otherwise, they all have the same four letters. It's how you put them together. So again, people say, ah, see, it's the same letters, so it has to be the same origin. We say not necessarily. It's the same designer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the same creator. Out of his magnificence, he's trying to tell us, look, I use four letters and rearrange them in a way to make a mouse a mouse and a tree a tree. The same four letters, subhanAllah. Can you do this? Again, even the production, now those of you who study the DNA and how it's produced or how it's made and the codons, for example, and the making of the machinery, proteins and so on and so forth, how could that just be a random process? If any mistake happened in the DNA, you have a problem. It's a very tight you know, process, very controlled process. How did all this happen? So our argument would, would be that just because the codons of the DNA are similar, that does not suggest that there is the same origin, but rather the same creator, one creator. Then that leaves us with one last thing. So people say, okay, and this was an issue with the Christian theology. Christians, some priests, they kind of traced back the age of earth. But how did they do it? They went back with the age of the prophets. They started, they said, they suggested that Adam came, and so with Adam, it means earth was created. That's what some Christian priests suggested. And therefore, when they started going back, you know, how much time is between us and Adam? Give or take. So here and there, whatever, 17,000 years, 20,000 years, 25,000 years, give or take. So they suggested that this is the age of the earth. Again, that's in some Christian priests. Some Christian priests suggested this. Scientists came, they did some analogies and studies. They said, that's not true. Earth is much older than 25,000 years. We say, okay, no problem. So that's a suggestion that was a suggestion by a priest. They say, okay, you guys claim that Adam is the father of humanity. We say, yes. Okay. You're all the children of Adam. We say, yes. Just as a side note, by the way, side note here. I don't want to digress. But there is a professor who studied DNA. He found DNA in an organelle inside the cell called the mitochondria. DNA is usually found in the nucleus. But the DNA in the nucleus changes through the process of meiosis. Those of you who, you know, as, as cell division happens. So they discovered DNA in the mitochondria, which was quite interesting. And the unique thing about the DNA in the mitochondria is conserved. It does not undergo the process of you know, interchange and so on and so forth. So what he did, what this scientist did, was trace back the origin of the DNA in the mitochondria. And he suggested, he suggested 
that there is actually an Adam. And there is an Eve. That's what that DNA in the mitochondria suggests. Now, there is some controversy when he proposed this. Some scientists said, what are you talking about? You know, how could there be? Now, all of a sudden, you're talking about creation. Now, you're saying what the Christians are saying is true. But besides the point, interestingly, he suggested there is an Adam and an Eve. Now, so they come back to us. They say, okay, you guys claim that Adam and Eve, Adam and Hawa, alayhim salam were the first of Allah's creation on this earth. And you, you guys are the descendants. We say, yes, we are the descendants of Adam and Eve. They say, what about the discoveries that we make about some fossils of human beings or what look like human beings, we call them the Netherlands, who are like 100,000 years old or more, give or take. If you claim that Adam is only 25,000 years old, where did these guys come from? Here, alhamdulillah, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, Ahlul Bayt gave us answers. First of all, in Surah Al Baqarah, ayah number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when your Lord said to the angels that I am making a representative on earth, they said, قَالُوا أَتَجْعَلُ فِيهَا مَنْ يُفْسِدُ فِيهَا وَيَسْفِكُ الدِّمَا Will you put on this earth one who will cause corruption and bloodshed? Question, how did the angels know? How did the angels know that this formula that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making is going to cause corruption and bloodshed. It suggests that maybe they have seen an experience from a previous generation. When they saw the same mixture, these components are put together, they may suggest a similar issue. And hence, they kind of made that deduction. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responded to them, قَالَ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ I, I, I have knowledge of things that you guys don't know about. Now I'm not here to discuss what is that knowledge and so on and so forth. But the whole point is how did the angels know? So that's one thing. Then there is a hadith. Riwayah attributed to Al-Imam Al-Baqir, صَلَوَاتُ اللَّهِ وَسَلَامُهُ عَلَيْهِ Imam Al-Baqir, and this riwayah you can find it in kitab called Kitab Al-Tawheed, the Shaykh Al-Saduq, قَدَّسَ اللَّهِ نَسَهُ الزَّكِيَة Sheikh al-Saduq died عام, al عام, 381 He died in the year 381 after Hijrah يعني more than a thousand years ago He has a book called Kitab al-Tawheed In it, this riwayah comes It's narrated Where he tells Jabir Ibn Yazid al-Ju'fi do you think that Adam, your Adam, was the first Adam to walk on this earth? Before your Adam, there were, according to this narration, a thousand Adams who walked on this earth. Suggesting maybe there was a creation before our creation who walked on this earth. But from the Ahadith, from the Riwayat, that creation terminated. Yani we are not the descendants of that creation. We are the descendants of Adam. كُلُّكُمْ لِآدَمُ وَآدَمْ مِنْ تُرَابُ You know, as the tradition says, that you're all from Adam, and Adam was created from sand. So, apparently, our generation of humanity, we are all the descendants of Adam and Hawa. Okay. However, there may have been other generations who walked on this earth before us. This would explain what we observe today in terms of fossils. And it seems from the ruayat, it seems that that creation was not as sophisticated as us. Interestingly, until now, now maybe they will find later, but so far, so far, they have not found any civilization or evidence of a civilization from, let's say, 100,000 years ago. Yes, they may find a civilization from the Egyptians, you know, like our generation of humanity from the Indians, for example, the Persians, the Mayans, and so on and so forth, you'll find. But from 100,000 years ago, we have not yet seen a civilization. Okay. So it suggests, Allahu A'lam, God knows best, 
that they may not have been as sophisticated as we are. Allahu Akbar. But this is all the response that we have to this. And then of course, when we come to the Quran, Quran clearly says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. He is the former, the one who formed the shapes. He shaped, he gave the images and so on and so forth. Yani Allah is the creator. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly in the Quran suggests to us that look at the signs. Ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fil afaq wa fi anfusihim. Yani look at the, look at yourself and you'll see the perfection and the beauty inside and you claim to be a small tiny thing but within you there's a whole world inside you and even today many physicians interestingly you talk to some physicians because of the advancement of medicine they become specialized so there is a cardiologist there is a nephrologist urologist and so on and so forth and sometimes when you talk to somebody like a cardiologist about the bones, he says, I don't really know much. That's not my field. I tell him, but you're a physician. He says, that's not my field of, of you know. Yeah, and it's become so sophisticated. One day I was talking to a, a surgeon, a bone surgeon. And I, you know, we were having a conversation, so I started speaking to him about kidney stones. I told him I did my PhD on kidney stones and started explaining certain things to him. He says, you probably know more about kidney stones than I do. I told him, but you're a physician. He says, that's not my field. That's not my field. So it's become so sophisticated that even doctors these days, if he it goes a little out of his specialization, he says, I don't know much. That's it, that's my limit. Yani how complicated is this body where even a doctor would say, this is not my color, I don't know. I don't know much. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this whole complexity, again, I go back to the point we mentioned earlier, complexity suggests there is a designer, a maker of this complexity. And all this shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the maker. So here in this ayah, Allah number, in ayah number eight says, وَخَلَقَنَاكُمْ azwaja." We created you. And here Allah says pairs, pairs. Yani in the Quran, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suggests the creation is male and female. Alam yaku nutfatan min maniyin yumna. Thumma kana alakatan fa khalaqa fa sawa. Fa ja'ala minhu zawjain al dhakar wal untha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he refers to the creation, he says it's male and female. These are the two creations that we have made in this world. According to many ayat of the Quran, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. We created you, O people, from a male and a female. Fa, yani, many ayat of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the humanity is made up of those male and female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. Now, inshallah, in the next session, we'll discuss a little bit more about this whole concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the male and the female and the concept of marriage and how marriage is also a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as per the ayah of the Quran where he says that it is a sign of, of, of Allah. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ The signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ azwaja That he created for you from amongst yourselves, spouses. Inshallah, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase our understanding of the Holy Qur'an and our belief and submission to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَىٰ أَرْوَاحِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَلِقَضَاءِ الْحَوَائِجِ وَلِشِفَاءِ الْمَرْضَىٰ رَحِمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ قَرَأَ السُّورَةَ الْمُبَارَكَةَ الْفَاتِحَ مَعَ الصَّلَوَاتِ اللَّهُ صَلَّى عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدُ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدُ وَحَجَّلْ فَرَجَمْ